So hi, we're going to talk about Windows Server 2019 and persistent memory, because persistent memory rocks and I just love it. My name is DJ Van Hoyer, better known as Working Hard in IT, and anything you want to know about me is on this slide. So have a look at it, play it back, but we are going to continue with persistent memory. So what is this? Well, it's quite easy. It is storage at the speed of memory. And what's not to like about the speed of memory, right? So... Uh, there are a couple of persistent memory types. There are the non-volatile DIMMs, the NV DIMMs. There are different variations of them. You have what some vendors call storage class memory, SCM, and then there is memory class storage. Uh, but don't get caught up in these semantics because things are changing and NV DIMMs are different to storage class memory, but that is more or less true depending on the type, etc. Memory class storage, however, is a category of its own. So the two, the two examples that we have here are the ones you can actually buy today easily. That's NVIDIM N and 3DX Point from Intel, uh, the, their obtained series, right? the persistent data center memory. Now, they can both be used as normal memory or as um, persistent memory. And you can access the storage uh, either in direct mode, so at the byte level, or block addresses, which means like ordinary storage as you know it today. So DAX is a lot faster than block uh, access, but block access of course has the advantage that it works uh, with any application that exists, so it's backward compatible, so to speak. To use DAX, you need applications that are DAX aware. Now, these variants in NVDIM are N, F, and P, and it's basically just uh, memory DRAM mapped uh, to the memory. Flash is not mapped, and it's only used for persistence, uh, the flash. The flash is there uh, with a battery pack, and we'll discuss this a bit later. Uh, other things to know is it's very fast, there's very low latency, but the capacities are literally tied to the capacity of uh, memory DIMMs, so that's 8 to 32 gigabits. Maybe later they will grow a bit, but there is a limit there. The NVDIMM Fs are very special ones. They are actually flash put on a memory stick, so you can uh, put them in a memory slot. But that also means that they are very slow compared to memory. They have high latency and their capacity, of course, that's the big one here, is a lot bigger. But it's a niche market. It's available, but it's vendor specific and I don't s have never seen it in the wild. And then what we are aiming for in the future is NVDMP because that will combine both flash and RAM uh, to be memory mapped. So you can have direct access or byte access. Uh, it has the, the latency of NVMEs or better uh, and they have larger capacities. This is not available, however. We should get it in the DDR5 timeframe, but uh, still it's not available. So how does that NVDIM and NV DIM N that we have now today available to us work. Well, actually, every, everything is happening in RAM. And the moment you shut down the server or you have a server crash due to a blue screen or because you lose power, you have this battery pack that's needed to put all the data that's in memory into that NAND flash. And if you boot, then it all has to be reloaded into the, the system. And that's what you see happening uh, with a server when it boots. It's actually arming the, the NVDIMM and, and it's restoring the memory. So that needs to happen. Uh, the F, we've discussed this. It's slow. You can use it now, today, with DDR4, but it's a niche market. That uh, NVDIMM P, which combines both of the best of both worlds, uh, actually looks a lot, a lot like what storage class memory does, right? You don't really need that battery pack anymore. You have some capacitators on the module. You have both DRAM and NAND on there. And uh, it isn't available yet for NVDIMM P, but that storage class memory, however, is available. And that's what we call uh, SCM uh, from Intel Obtain, the DC persistent memory. So you have the higher capacities, which is what we want. You can use it with DDR4, so it's usable today. Uh, however, what you need to remember is uh, NVDIMM N, for example, can only be used with specific BIOSes, so it has some dependencies on the server. But these can only be used with certain types of CPUs from 
Intel and not from AMD and not with other CPUs. So they all have their dependencies and their, and their requirements. It's not just buy them and just drop them into any, any old server you might have lying around. And then, of course, the memory class storage that we have uh, today, or that we are looking at today. Uh, we have uh, nano RAM, we've got RAM, we've got uh, magneto RAM, and it's all very cool. It's all the best of both worlds. It has all the benefits of memory without the drawbacks of memory. It has all the benefits of, of uh, flash storage without the drawbacks of flash storage. So this is pretty cool, right? This is very low cost to make, could go to high capacities, it should uh, be a lot faster than uh, Flash or NVMe, so it's memory-like. has enormously high endurances, at least the promise of it. Uh, very high reliability in terms of long data retention, uh, but also in terms of uh, being able to operate under extreme temperatures. It has very low power usage, and it also means that uh, because it's like storage, you don't have that refresh cycles of memory, so it's a lot more efficient. What's not to love? There's only one thing wrong with this picture. Uh, it can do everything in the world, apparently, but it doesn't get out of the lab. So we're waiting for this one. Now, why do we care? Well, uh, we have this ever bigger need for faster and bigger storage. Uh, and we have been doing quite well in speed. You have the on the top end and the, the, let's say the expensive end, we have the L1 to L3 caches but that you find on CPUs. It's very fast, but it's also very expensive and very small. And then you have the, the, the run of the mill server and PC memory that you know. On the bottom end, we've gone from HDDs to SSDs to NVMEs, and along with that, we we changed our connectivity type from IDE to SATA to SAS to PCIe buses. And now with PMEM, we are trying to do that with memory slots. Why? Because, well, we have this need to bring our data to the CPU for processing as fast as possible. So we've been achieving that, but going to the memory slot is the fastest part to the, to the CPU. And why do we want this? Well, the data has been growing exponentially. And if you look at the curve, it's quite kind of disconcerting how fast it is going, how the, the, the predictions are actually almost unbelievable. But this is happening. And then all this data needs to be used, parsed, processed in relational databases, in, in memory databases, in scale-out storage systems, and then we're going to run big data analytics against it. And they all need to get to that data as fast as possible, hence the need for PMAM. Now, it's all about value. I mean, you are not going to buy this to increase the speed of a Microsoft Access database. Let's be very clear about that. It is not for everyone, but when you need it, you need it, and then it makes a huge difference. So let's go to the next slide here because I'm stuck. So if you look at the entire spectrum of hardware, we are getting ever faster memory. The network speeds have gone up to 200 gigabits per second and are still rising. We have gone from SSDs to NVMEs and now we have uh, the PMEM, all that in very modern hardware. So things on the hardware side are looking actually very good and it's the software that needs to catch up now. So we were going to talk about Windows Server 2019 because we are at a certain state state with Windows Server uh, in regards to how it can use persistent memory. So let's look at that. Uh, in the lab, I had NVDIMM ENS, so that's what I'm talking about. But what I'm telling you is, uh, let's say, usable for any type you can get, which there's, there's two of them, right? NVDIMM and, and uh, the Intel Obtains. So we have to turn it on the BIOS for uh, NVDIMM ENS, and this is important. If you forget, well, then it's ordinary memory. As I said, you can use them for both uh, use cases. And then there's another one you would like to see uh, and pay attention to is NVDIMM interleave. You can disable it or enable it. And for now, we'll leave it disabled. So what does that mean if you have a system like that and you've booted is this is what you'll see in device manager. And if you run get PMEM physical device, you will see six devices, which because I have six in the, in the server three per CPU socket. Then you can run get PMEM unused region and you'll see six regions, one region per device. And that's because we, we have not used interleaving. So you still don't see a disk here, 
what you need to do is grab those regions and turn them into disks. And that's what we're doing right here. And once you've run this command, you will see the persistent memory disk show up over here. It takes a little bit of time, but not too much. And if you then run get pmem disk, you will find the disks. That's as simple as it gets, actually. Now, we've talked about that interleave thingy. Well, let's do that. Let's go into that BIOS and enable it, and then boot our server. You will still, still see six devices. You will st still see six devices in PowerShell. But when you do get pmem unused region, you will see you have only two regions. We have actually aggregated these devices per CPU socket, socket within the same region. So we have two regions, three devices in each region. If we now grab the regions and create uh, pmem disks from them, you will see them appear here as interleaved persistent memory disks. Why do you want to do that? Well, basically because you want to create disks of higher capacity. The thing to notice is this is a very neat trick. It's uh, very, let's say, recommended that you use this depending on your use case. But it has one thing you need to consider, there is no redundancy. So if you lose one of these DIMMs, devices, in an interleave disk, the disk is gone. So that's, uh, if you want redundancy and protection against that, you will have to go higher up the stack. It will have to be the storage solution that provides it for you, but it isn't built into the, the physical disk. So how do we consume that? Well, we've created the disk, so... We find them when we run get pmem disk. Uh, you can also say get disk, basically the commands you know from all types of disks on Windows, but say, hey, I want the bus type to be SCM, storage class memory, and then you will find them. It's, uh, you can see the numbers, so you will take those raw disks, you will initialize them with GPT, and then you'll create a new partition, assign a drive letter, format it, give it a file label, and then you can choose to use isdax, true or false, and if you use uh, dax, then you can do that direct access to the storage, which is very fast. But not all applications can use that, but for SQL Server, for example, for log files, this is great. And if you want to check if a volume is DAX, well, FSUtil is your friend. Now, once you have that disk, uh, as I said, SQL Server server could use it in DAX mode, or even your file server could use it in block mode and uh, be the fastest file server on earth, if you have the money and the need to do so. Probably not, but you can. But there is another way. You can consume this uh, uh, PMEM directly in the virtual machine. So how do you do that? Well, you need to have Windows Server 2019 Hyper-V and then there's some uh, requirements. That means you can only use Generation 2 virtual machines, which, it, which isn't too big a deal. You want to use them anyway. Then you have this new disk type, the VHD PMEM extension, defines actually that the virtual disk is a persistent memory disk. And those files have to be created on an NTFS DAX volume. That means that Hyper-V is DAX aware, just like SQL Server. Uh, for now, you can only create uh, fixed size persistent memory disks, but that's not a biggie. And the command is the, the most familiar command you probably know in, uh, in Hyper-V if you are creating disks in PowerShell. The only difference is the disk extension, which defines it as a persistent memory virtual disk. Cool. Now, once we've done that, we've got the virtual disk. Now we want to use it in a virtual machine, but to use it in a virtual machine, we need, we need to add a virtual machine PMEM controller to it, which is a very simple command. Then you add your your hard drive to that virtual machine uh, to the controller that you just created, and that's it. You cannot mount this uh, virtual PMEM disk to a standard SCSI controller. It needs to be this uh, PMEM controller you added. Hence the controller location. Normally the controller location 0 is the one that's default. So inside that virtual machine, it just shows up as a disk. So if you run get disk in that virtual machine and you specify the bus type as SCM, hey, there is your, pers uh, your persistent disk. And Hyper-V knows this is a persistent disk. It sees this. And then again, you create uh, a drive, a volume, you partition it, uh, you format it as NTFS, and uh, you could choose to even use it as a DAX volume or not, because inside of your virtual machine, you can run SQL Server, which is DAX aware, 
or if you want to use another workload that needs block level access because it doesn't know about a direct access, well, use NTFS without a DAX option and you're good to go. It's as easy as that. Now, all good and well, you've got a new disk type, you have some uh, new capabilities, but what does this do for you? Well, this is a virtual machine and we are running a 4K workload with 24 workers, 100% read and 100% sequential. So that's, that's a pretty easy optimized workload to, for getting high IOPS. And look at what we're getting here. 1.5 million in a single virtual machine with two persistent memory disks. That is nice. I was really amazed to see this because normally you would need um, 12 to 60 node clusters with all kinds of tweaking and very expensive storage and networking to make this work. And now I've done this on a single Hyper-V host with a single VM, just like that. Now, it becomes even better because I thought, now let's do something more realistic. Let's go for the 8K workloads with 24 workers and 70% read, 30% write, and make 30% of the IO random. Well, look here, it's still 1.44 or 1.45 million IOPS per second with a very decent latency. Okay, you have to give the machine a couple of CPUs, of course, to handle all that workload, but this is very nice. And I was really, really so happy to see this and I got kind of addicted to it. Uh, it's always hard to give that sort of hardware back to the people that actually bought it. Now, I was also playing with disk SPD to see if I could get the same results. And well, basically this is the same test with the 30% uh, writes and the random IO. And I got to 1.75 million IOPS at a latency you would kill for, basically. So this is pretty neat to see. The only trick that you need to remember is you have to disable, that's what this is, you, uh, the SH option, uh, you have to disable caching because otherwise, you know, if you try to do caching, the hardware is so fast that the caching and the software just can't keep up. So you're actually reducing your performance. So with disk SPD, don't forget to disable the caching. But this is so neat. You could do this all week long, month after month, and, and still never get bored of doing so because it's so great. Now, as we said, only generation two VMs are supported. Uh, you also need to make sure that you create a VHD PMEM disk uh, on your NTFS DAX volume. And you can do some new, neat things. You can still convert VHDs from v, v, VHD PMEM to VHDX and, and vice versa. Uh, you can select your atomicity at creation time. That is either none or BTT. And BTT is block translation table. Uh, Normally, uh, in, an, in an SSD or an NVMe, you have protection against torn sectors because they have capacitators or some firmware that handles that for you, but you don't have that with PMEM. So if you do block level access, you need that protection or you run risk of data corruption. And that's what selecting a uh, block translation table does for you. The also funny is, just like a reg regular virtual disk, you can mount it in the host and read and write data from it, which is kind of cool. And for now, you can only create one uh, virtual PMEM device from uh, one, uh, well, that translates into one VHD PMEM file. You can't create multiple on the same device, but that is for the moment the case. I don't know if that will remain, but that's something I noticed. Uh, both DAX and BTT is supported in the guest, which means you can run SQL Server and optimize it for direct access or use your block level workloads. You use large pages automatically for better performance, but you have some uh, negatives as well. There's no live migration uh, to this point. I'm pretty sure they will build it because the competition has it. There's no way that you can do a checkpoint on those disks and backup is also missing. And then again, save and restore is not there, but this is least le less important to me and maybe to you as well. But it's good to know that these are the limitations at the moment. Now, there is another way to use PMEM and that is in S2D, storage spaces direct. Now, uh, you can use it as a storage tier. So, then in that case, you know, for S2D, the recommended file system and the one you always use is REFS, but that doesn't have DAX support, which means if you were planning to run native SQL Server work workloads on that cluster, that's not going to happen because then you don't have DAX. 
well, you can still run SQL Server, but not have the direct I.O. in that case. And of course, the uh, recommendation is to make sure that you use interleaving, so you aggregate the disks to have higher capacity. Uh, because otherwise, uh, I think the biggest one at the moment, if you use the Intel Optane, is 512 gigabytes. So you might might want to, you know, add a couple of those in uh, an aggregate via interleaving to make them bigger. But you can also use the PMMS cache, and then you don't have to worry about are we a VAS and DAX support because it's just a cache, right? You don't need uh, to worry about the overhead of block level access. Caching has nothing to do with all that. Still, you might want to use a bigger disk for your cache, and then interleaving again is the recommended way to do so. Now, the good thing is, I told you with interleaving that there is no red redundancy. If you lose one of the physical devices, you lose the entire interleaved persistent disk. But S2D, of course, is the storage layer that provides the uh, protection against disk failure, and that takes care of that for you in this case. With Hyper-V, you don't have that. If in Hyper-V one of the disk's uh, devices goes bad, well, you've lost your virtual disk. So that's something uh, we'll have to see uh, how they address that in the future. And if you put that in a nice picture, you will see if you use your persistent memory in a capacity device uh, use case, then you, well, if you've got the money and the taste for it, you can build an S2D node completely out of uh, persistent memory, have a ball. Now, in reality, you probably might want, might want to combine it as a persistent memory or storage class memory in combination with NVMEs or even with SSDs. Uh, there is no HDD in here because that is, let's say, lipstick on a pig. These are way too fast to combine with HDDs. This is that that would be that would be nonsensical. You can also use desk caching devices, but again, same deal. It's going to be persistent memory with NVMEs or SSDs. It doesn't really make sense to use it with HDDs. Now, as I said, S2D, your disk is a normal fall fallible disk, and S2D will provide a protection against disk failures. That's the benefit you get here. But you might have noticed something. Uh, I said REFS is used with S2D. S2D doesn't support DAX, which means that on S2D, how do you create a Hyper-V virtual machine with a persistent memory file if you have to create it on, the, on an NTFS disk with DAX? Well, you don't. <laughs> That's basically the answer. And then there are some interesting observations to make. Uh, if you look at a picture from Microsoft, you will see the physical device, and then there are three drivers types associated with such a device. The PMEM sys, sys which is actually taking care of the I.O. and uh, the management stages of the logical disk in Windows. The NVDIM sys takes care of the physical management. And then there's the SEM bus, which talks to ACP, ACPI sys, to the BIOS, so that's for power management, for plug and play, all the things that have to do with the BIOS interacting with the physical PMM device. So being a, an inquisitive boy, I went to look around for where I could find them, and yes, if you go and look in Device Manager and you go to the physical devices, you will indeed find the NVDIMM sys driver associated with that physical device, just as it says in the picture. And yes, if you go to the logical disk, the persistent memory disk we created, you will find that PMEM sys driver associated with it. Cool, so where does that SEM bus sys live? Well, you go into your uh, system devices and then you find it over here on the storage class memory bus and here is the driver. So that was a bit of snooping around to find them in the system, which is always cool. Just checking up if they are not telling us anything that uh, isn't true or if we can find what they are telling us, which is also nice. And then there's always this nice thing. Everything from Microsoft that is brand new seems to have been created with a driver in 2006, which is kind of funny. I always find that funny. Now, conclusion. This is absolutely fantastic uh, technology. Uh, we are not where we want to be yet. And uh, the big one, of course, we're waiting for is uh, NVIDIA because we have a hope that you can use that in more servers in the future and with multiple uh, CPU vendors. Uh, 
of course, Intel isn't uh, staying quiet. They are working on next generations of that uh, Intel Optane. And then, of course, there's that memory class storage, you know, the Valhalla of storage that will be all the benefits of memory without the drawbacks and all the benefits of flash without the drawbacks, all combined in one. Uh, they have the potential to be used in portable devices like smartphones. What if your laptops could be made with such a uh, disk? It's so fast it could boot in less than a second. And if, if when it's shut down or in a power save mode, it consumes no virtually no uh, battery or power so your your devices last longer. Anything that's portable and needs persistent storage that is highly fast, capable, uh, low power consumption can benefit from this. And that means our storage systems and Hyper-V as well. So it's going to be very interesting to see in the future where this is uh, going to. But again, all these new technologies like uh, Nano RAM or RAM or Magneto RAM, they are very, very interesting. But unfortunately, despite uh, the progress they've made over the years, they are still in the lab and they seem to be stuck there. So I don't think this is going to go super fast. I'm, I think we're going to see a couple of years before we see those appear at, a, at an affordable price rate uh, and at a decent availability. But also, it's about time that NVDMP came onto the market because that's been going on for a while uh, as well. And uh, things are not going as fast as we technologists uh, would like it to be. But that's kind of normal if you live at the cutting edge. Uh, there's this saying, right? We are always six months away from the state we want to be in or a year away from the state we want to be in. And when we get there, well... <laughs> it just repeats itself. But I hope you found this interesting and you have learned something about persistent memory and why it is so great and where you can use it today. Uh, it is not perfect, but we are getting there and uh, I'm pretty sure that the next version of Windows is going to hold some surprises and some very nice additions to the capabilities with PMEM. So thank you for joining my talk and I'll catch you all later. Bye bye.